Hello, I wrote this article, hopefully most of it is correct, about how pointing devices such as your mouse or tablet or whatever works in Linux. It goes through from the protocols from serial human interface devices and explains how everything goes from the hardware to the kernel, various subsystems like EV dev, UDEV, and so on, and then finally to the compositor. If you want to read this article, I think it has some decent information. Other than that, let's get started. We are building a compositing window manager, also just known as a compositor in Wayland. If you'd like to support this project, be sure to give it a star. In this video, I'll be showing you how I actually implemented your cursor image. Going into our state.rs file, two new additions. First is this cursor status, and that is the cursor image status from Smith A, from the input pointer cursor image status. And this could have several values. Here you can see I use it if the cursor is hidden. So want the cursor not to be shown on the screen. If we want to use the default cursor image or if the client provides its own cursor. So for example, a video game might have a target cursor. So it will provide that for us to display. Or if there's no client open, we'll just want to show the default cursor. So back in the state, we also want to keep track of where the pointer is located. Then in the main.rs file, when we're actually building our state, so we first just set the cursor image status to default, and we set the pointer location just to be at the 0, 0 coordinates. Now we need to have an element, and from our previous videos, I say R because of course you're involved in this video, you'll know that really an element is just a generic thing that we want to show on the screen. So we need to essentially create our own element that represents the cursor. So to do that, we need to define our own element. And here in the element.rs file, I've done just that. So pointer element, this will have a default cursor that is contained in a B tree map that maps a U64 to a texture buffer. We have total delay, current delay, and then the current status of this pointer element. The default, you might be asking yourself, what is that? What is this structure? It contains a representation of an X cursor. And the X cursor is a specification of the format of cursor files and how to load them and use them. So you might just think of a cursor as an image, but it can be more than that. For example, a cursor can have a spinning loader. So there also needs to be a way to actually animate a cursor image. And this specifies how to do that. The image file will contain things like width, height, x hot, x y hot, which is where the tip of the cursor image is, the delay between the animation frames. So you can think of if it's a spinner, then each frame will cause a slight movement, creating that spinning look. And the system will have this environment variable x cursor theme. So maybe you'll have a light or in a dark theme. So you want to get the cursor theme. Then we get the cursor size here. The default in most systems is 24, but it can also be others like 32, 48, 64. Use the cursor theme, which I'm using the X cursor crate to actually load the theme. So that will get all the cursor icons for that theme. Then load the default cursor for that theme. This gets the cursor path, open the cursor file, load it, get the data from the cursor, then use this parse X cursor from the X cursor crate to actually get all that info that we want, like the delay, the width, and so on. And this creates a VEC of cursor images because like I said before, there can be many images in a cursor file representing an animation. Then create a B tree map that will contain the delay from zero, then maybe wait 10 milliseconds, then another 10 milliseconds between each image and so on. And so really that's an ordered time period. So that's why I'm using a B tree map. Store each of the delays as the key and this default variable. So to do that, just loop through all the cursor images, get the total delay, which will be the key. So starting will be zero, then let's say there's 10 milliseconds, then the next one will be 10 milliseconds. Then let's say there's another 10 milliseconds, so that'll be 20 milliseconds and so on. Use the renderer and specify that the renderer must, must implement import memory 
So if you're thinking about like OpenGL, this allows us to import a texture by generating and binding the textures since we're using OpenGL ES 2.0 as our renderer. So we'll get the pixel data, then specify the size. Figure out what this faults does, but you can look in the docs if you want to know. Then we need to create a texture buffer from this texture that can then be used to actually render the element. And that provides damage tracking for the texture. Then insert the key as the total delay and also the texture buffer as the value. This returns the struct with its default values. There's some other helpers like set current delay. So for that, pass in a monotonic clock, create a duration from this current time from when it first started. So let's say it started a thousand milliseconds ago, then we get a duration for that. Get the current duration as milliseconds and then take the mod of the total delay. And this will give us the current delay, basically just the remainder, causing this to be cycling around the total delay. So for example, if it's a 100 millisecond total delay and the duration gets to 200 milliseconds, then it will restart the animation. And we use this current delay to find out which texture buffer we should show. Then this set status helper sets the status of the cursor image. So if we should use the default cursor, if we should hide the cursor, custom cursor. Then this is a very helpful macro from Smithe that allows us to represent two elements as one. So if you think about this, we have our texture element that is our default cursor, but then the client can give us a cursor to show but that format will be in a surface. And a surface is represented by a Wayland surface render element, while our texture will output a texture render element. This combines those two outputs into our one pointer render element. This as render elements needs to be implemented for our pointer element so that we can actually convert this pointer element into render elements that the renderer can use to produce a frame. So implement this and then say the render element will be a pointer render element that is produced by this macro. And this render elements function needs to be implemented. Match on the status. If it's hidden, then we just return no render elements and then nothing will be shown. If it's a default, then select from the default B tree map, get a range that starts at the current delay till the end, and then get the frame that matches that range as the texture, because the current delay might not be an exact key if it goes every 10 milliseconds. Well, we need to show something at maybe the 15th millisecond. So this range allows us to select a texture, even if it doesn't exactly match. Then use this texture to produce a texture render element that Smith A provides. And it takes, and it has this from texture buffer function that we can pass the texture into. And we need to do dot one to get the buffer. Then also the location of where this render element is, which we get from the render elements, and then return this element. Now, if the client has given us a surface to use, then use this helper function render elements from surface tree to use the Wayland surface and actually produce those Wayland surfaces render element objects. And that's how the pointer element is actually implemented. We now need to actually use that in our compositor. So down here, I create a pointer element specifying that it needs to be a OpenGL ES2 texture and give it our backend renderer, which is that OpenGL renderer. Then I can now use this. So let's see where this is used. Pointer element. So this is in the event loop that that is being pumped by a timer. So this will be called every so often when it is called, when this event loop runs, then 
set the current delay from the state clock, which is that monotonic clock, set the current status from the state cursor status, and this is actually set in our state.rs file. Smith A allows us to hook into certain actions. So one of the actions that we want to handle is when the cursor wants to set a new image. So that's on the seat handler, which is that provides this hook into when when a client wants to set an image. And when that happens, this cursor image function will be called with the image status. So it might say hide the cursor. In that case, it'll hide it. It might say give it the default, or it might actually give it a surface to render. And that's where this cursor status is set. Now the cursor position is from the pointer location. So we actually want to store whenever you're moving the cursor around. And that will be a wnit event like I covered before. And that event is right here. So listen for a wnit event. And it will give us this input event. And we want for when the user moves the cursor. So that will be a pointer motion absolute event. You can get the pointer location by using this position transformed helper on the output geometry. So the output is like the area where you can see stuff basically corresponding to your monitor. Convert the device position to the output's coordinate system to get our pointer location. Since we'll then be positioning the cursor on that output's coordinate system, save that into the state pointer location. Then this also does a few other things, like we pass on that pointer motion event to the client because this bubbles up from the kernel. So the kernel will get a head report saying there was motion on the X and Y axis for this mouse. We get this input event that is from lib input. You can search that or read that article that I wrote. And we're getting this from the kernel is the main thing. So the client doesn't yet know about this motion event. So you need to pass that on through this function on that pointer device that we get from the seat, which if you watch the first video, it manages all of the different input devices that you have. The serial counter is just atomic integer, if I'm remembering correctly, that just increments up. So if we send an event and then we get an event back. The client might need to say, we're responding to this specific event. So to do that, it can the compositor can match with this serial, essentially ID if necessary. But continuing on, then now that we keep track of that cursor position, we'll need to scale it if the output is scaled. So get the cursor position and then use this to physical function that will allow us to scale the cursor position to A to match what the output is using. Then pass that, pass where we want the cursor position rendered into this render elements function that showed before, pass the OpenGL renderer and also the scale of the output. Now that I have this custom elements, you can pass it into this render output function that Smith A provides. Pass it right here, elements as slice. And if you're curious to see how this works behind the scenes, if you look in render output for the Smith A crate, you can see it'll call this damage tracker render output, pass in the render elements that we give it. If you look in the damage tracker, it loops through all the elements and then calls dot draw on them for each element. So if you look in the damage .res file in the smithy crate. First it will call render.render, so it'll call that render that we provide it. And that function will set various OpenGL parameters and produce a frame. Then the damage.rs file, if you look in here, this will call element.draw pass in the frame and some other stuff. So if we want an example of an element, we can look at that Wayland surface render element. 
So it'll just be a surface, whether it's a window or a cursor or so on. And this will call frame dot render texture from to. So this gets the texture associated with the surface and calls that method. And this method will render the texture based on the parameters in damage location provided. So you can look at this code if you want more in-depth details on how it actually works. But that is the basics of how I got the cursor to show up in my window manager. So if you look, you can see this cursor icon. If I open a window, you can see how it changes the cursor icon based on what I'm hovering in. So I think that is pretty cool. Thank you for watching.